Um, Deviant's a, um, an auditor and security professional. He's uh, done a lot of work around lock picking and is on the, on the board, sorry, for, uh, for Tool, the U.S. Lost my note. The U.S. Uh, organization for lock pickers. Uh, he's here today, like I said, to talk about the elevator hacking, and uh, I've seen this talk a couple times myself. It's very entertaining, very um, um, informational. So please, big hand for, for Deviant. All right. I kind of wander around a little bit. I'll stand this way so you can see past my wall of uh, elevator locks and such if I'm still on camera. Is that good? Okay. So, yeah. Who are the people who, who put this crazy talk together? Well, you heard a little bit about me. My name is Deviant. I do physical penetration work. I do physical pen testing, physical evaluation. My buddy on this one was Howard Payne. Howard's not here with us today, but he is an elevator consultant and way more responsible and knowledgeable in this field than I ever could have been if I hadn't met him, so I'm really grateful that he reached out to me. He saw me giving a talk about big buildings once, hotels and the like, and I mentioned a little bit about elevators, and dude just got in touch. He was like, man, you have no idea this industry doesn't take security seriously at all. So we started to have a good time with it. Um, speaking of not taking things seriously, hackers sometimes don't take things seriously. Now, elevators are generally safe. Elevators actually are not responsible for injuries all that often. When they are, they're minor. They're, you know, trip and fall if something mislevels at a landing. The few times in a given year that people are injured by elevators grievously, they're usually proper elevator techs who are working on them at the time. So that said, there are numerous failure modes that can occur with elevators that will involve grievous bodily harm. If you screw around with elevators because you think this was a funny talk or cool or you're like, oh, I can totally do that, I am not responsible if you, like, you know, trap your leg between the door sill and the landing sill or something like that. All right, downer stuff aside, most of you are not that stupid. Most of you are just mischievous. It's possible to break or damage or foul up an elevator by messing around with it in ways you shouldn't be. Now, just because you're smart enough to not rip an arm off, it doesn't mean you're not facing, like, a felony criminal mischief charge. So this is known as the escalator helicopter. It's funny, right? <laughs> Look at that guy. <laughs> Something as simple as that, if you don't know what you're doing, can cause tens of thousands of dollars in damage. This person wound up with a felony charge just for trying to, you know, helicopter himself on this and snapping the entire, like, side of it. If you don't know what you're doing, you probably shouldn't be doing it unless it's in a controlled and safe environment. So we are, we are security professionals, or at least Howard is. I just, you know, kind of tag along and act silly. As long as you follow that rule, just, you know, don't be a jack wagon, you're probably fine with this and most other kinds of hacking, right? So really quick, we're not going to break down the every possible type of elevator system that's out there. If you saw the very first time we talked about this at the Hope Conference in New York, how many people get to Hackers on Planet Earth in New York City? One hand, render man, all right. Uh, you should come. It's coming up this summer. It's a really good time. It's an interesting time. It's uh, where we first did like a two-hour long talk, and we got way into the nitty-gritty of every elevator system. I'm going to give you just some basics so you understand what we're talking about here. There are essentially two types of elevator propulsion systems. There's overhead traction, where you have a machine room up in the penthouse, way above the elevator, using cables to hoist. And there's beneath, tra there's beneath pressure from a piston, from a hydraulic system. Usually the motor room will be in the basement on a lot of those. Those fundamentally are your two methods of driving an elevator around a building. And you notice there's a penthouse motor room or like a basement motor room. The motor itself, the power of the elevator is not like in the cab. There's an external mach you know, machine driving this. The cab itself is really just floating along in the hoistway on some guide rails and some rollers, just letting itself be centered and aligned as another machine somewhere else in the building drives it up and down. Now, how are you interacting with the elevator? Well, industry terminology you need to know is fixtures. There are all kinds of fixtures. There's traveling lanterns. There's hall lanterns. There's, of course, the car operating panel, which is where you input all of your cab calls. There's the, you know, the hall buttons. There's all of these fixtures, most of which are just push buttons, also incorporating some key switches. We'll talk about them. That is how you send commands to the motor room. In the motor room, obviously we said earlier, we got some big winding hoist motors up here. You can have pumps in a hydraulic room, not as sexy. But in either case, you are interacting with, you are sending commands to the controller. 
The controller is the brains of the system. That is what takes all the input logic from you, as well as from a number of other sensors, puts it all together, and makes decisions about how to drive that elevator up and down in the hoistway. What other positions, you know, what other sensors can you have? Well, there's positioning sensors, right? The elevator needs to know where it is. These are roller switches, known as limit switches. So as the elevator is getting close to the end of its run, it's going to just trip these switches. They're simple dry contacts. And the controller is getting input saying, OK, we're hitting slow down one. We're hitting slow down two. OK, we're level with that platform. Or you notice there's a fourth one there. It's like, oh god, you completely shot past the final landing. You're on the final limit. Stop motor now. Like, that's an error condition that you can you know, have happen in an elevator. The elevator itself has what's known as a selector. When you are traveling up and down the hoistway, this device on the car itself is taking input usually from a magnetic style tape. There are older magnetic veins. There's newer ones that use QR code, which is dumb. But in general, the selector is telling the elevator system where it is in the hoistway. And we'll talk about what happens if that input gets a little goofy. If something goes very, very wrong, there are other machines, other devices up in the motor room. That would be the governors and the braking systems. Here we see an old-time uh, ball governor. We see a rope gripper. Unintended movement. Elevators are really good at arresting that movement, upward or downward travel. So elevators generally keep you very safe. If anything goes super wrong, there's even the buffer down in the pit. And that giant spring, that giant piston, that's not like where the elevator sits and rests when it's not in use at the bottom of its travel. That, normally, the elevator shouldn't contact that. But it is rated to, to withstand the entire weight of the elevator loaded fully at full travel speed. So if you overshoot the last landing, you will not die, like normally. <laughs> Elevators are actually really good at keeping you alive, just believe me. If you are not doing anything weird, if the elevator is on automatic mode, elevators are exceedingly safe. Now. There are other modes of service. Maybe you've been in a building. Somebody just tweeted at us the other day. They said, hey, why does this elevator say nonstop? And my, you know, they, they tweeted a photo. Well, that's something called attendant mode. There are different levels of permission you can get in an elevator's cab if you know how to unlock certain modes. Mostly, it involves just flipping switches, key switches or manual switches. So attendant service, if you have someone in an elevator operating it for like a hotel, they can decide, boy, this elevator is full of people. We probably shouldn't be collecting more calls further up this. Let me, just, let me reverse direction, go down to the lobby, get these people out of here. Non-stop or bypass, as you see in this photo, similar function. That's going to zoom past any floor landings that have registered calls. It's not going to dump those calls out. It's just going to ignore them for now. Also, if you want to ignore other like landing calls, so I'm not advocating you do this, right? I'm not, hey, this elevator is really crowded. Let's get down to the lobby. Hey, check it out, a switch. Let's flip it. I mean, yeah, this is what happens on attendant service mode. It's also what happens if you have a special key. Some buildings are designed to not need an attendant in the cab, but to give big shot people this kind of power, to just run the elevator without collecting other, other demand in the building. That's called executive service, or sometimes VIP service. The idea of, I want this cab just for where I want it to go, and I don't want to stop anywhere else, that can be pretty useful mostly in a convenience way. We'll talk about some security implications of that in other ways. Something you can do with, let's say, independent service we'll get to in a minute. An interesting one, uh, Sabbath service. I don't know how much you have that up here in, in Canada. Down in certain cities like Miami Beach, Florida, New York City, there's a lot of people who, for their religious reasons, don't want to interact with switches and toggles and electronics on the holidays, so like on their, on their holy days. So what's Sabbath mode? Well, no, not like Black Sabbath mode. It's it's literally, it's like Sabbath mode, Shabbat mode in an elevator. If you've never seen this, if you didn't see Bill Maher's film, Religious, where they talk about it, what does it do? Well, a person can get in an elevator. The elevator will, on a time cycle, it'll just go all the way up to the very top floor of a building. And without any user input, it'll just platform its way on every floor all the way down, letting people egress at their leisure. And therefore, they haven't actually like pushed a button. So... I mean, if you know anything about elevator systems, you're totally registering all kind of inputs with the controller by breaking the beam on the doors. So it's, if you think you're hacking God, like, I don't know how well that's actually working out for you. But the thing is, like, if you can flip an elevator into Sabbath service, suddenly every floor just becomes not only accessible, but like open door accessible. The elevator is going to go to every floor. And this might be a mode embedded in your controller that you didn't even know about. Something you should know about, and this is not even for security's sake, but please talk to your elevator service techs. 
There are optimization algorithms you can use, like peak service, load bypass service. If you've ever been in an elevator that's so full, you know, like they get angry, they start beeping on you, like, be, oh, we're overweight, somebody get out, fat ass. Like, I used to be really heavy, and like, that was usually my fault in elevators, right? Elevators know how heavy they are. You can use that input to your advantage in the controller. If the load sensor says, boy, this elevator is really full, and I'm trying to collect more of these hall calls that are registered on eight other floors, I should probably not do that. I should just go wherever it's going, usually the lobby, and get everyone the hell out. So you don't have to be that elevator that platforms at like every floor and the doors open and you're standing there with a bunch of other people. You're like, eh, sorry. Like you can enable this kind of stuff to get your building moving around faster. You can enable anti-nuisance modes where if somebody presses all the buttons too quickly or if it detects no passenger has broken the beam on the door sensor so that like, boy, why did we just get eight floor calls when no one got on the elevator? You can totally have that no, right. to, three, to prevent shenanigans and get people moving going. around a building right, fast. Awesome. This Boom, is an anti-nuisance elevator where we just tried to press recording. all the buttons and the elevator was like, lol, nope, and it would so just dump down. the calls all out. One, two, three, and boom, out. It's got, it's like, yeah, I said this like, lecture here. tells you where you are, and I'm going a little fast, by the way, because we, you know, we waited for some people to get in, so I hope you're bearing with me on this stuff. I want to get to the good stuff later. I said the selector tells you where, tells the elevator where it is in its travel. There's something called a correction run. Again, this is not so much a security implementation, but it's really interesting if you've never experienced this. If the elevator gets mixed up on its inputs, if the motor says, all right, I've wound this far, and my motor generator, my encoder says I've gone this far, but the selector says, no, I've, I've actually gone three floors. If the elevator kind of panics and says, whoa, whoa, why, why is this not matching up? The elevator can sometimes run at slow speed, usually inspection speed, so it's like one quarter normal speed, and it'll park all the way at the bottom, it'll travel the whole hoistway until it basically relearns the, ho the hoistway, and then it says, okay, I'm satisfied, my, my inputs are matching again, and all of a sudden, poof, it just works normally. And if you've ever been in an elevator that suddenly didn't go where you wanted it, and then went really slowly, and you're like, what is happening? You start freaking out if you're claustrophobic. It's probably just a correction run. You should report that to the building management if that happens. There's something went wrong, but the elevator tried to self-soothe, and there you go. What about like these kind of buttons? Oh, what's halfway in between floors or something? What's, well, no, there's all kind of odd quirks in the elevator industry. If you add floors, if you have rear doors, if a split level building is platforming at half floors, there's a lot of strange stuff you'll see, especially on the badges on the, the car operating panel. Totally tweet photos at like me or Howard Payne. We, we love that stuff and we will usually, Howard will explain it instantly. He's like, oh yeah, that's totally a Dover impulse system. You can see it was modernized in 2007 because of the nature of the fire keys you got there. And he's, I bet you there's a rear door. Turn around, show me those rear doors on the door buck. Like he'll just spew on Twitter and, you're, and the person replies like, wow, how'd you know that? It was one blurry photo. Totally the kind of stuff we love talking about. We talked about peak mode, obviously. Why is your elevator platforming and parking itself at like the top floor if it's the morning when everyone's trying to go up? You can set the floors where the elevator will idle and wait for people at different times of the day. Stuff that's a little more interesting, not so much up here. You don't have a lot of earthquakes up here, right? There are modes in an elevator where it will detect seismic unrest. It will detect if a building is swaying or shaking or vibrating. Maybe up here you'd set it off with like blasting and stuff that you do to extract minerals. But if the elevator can detect problem conditions, again, the elevators are really good at keeping you alive. They will go to the lobby, they'll sit there with their doors open, and they'll wait. What if you have a different kind of unrest, though? Because we got a lot of irate hockey fans sometimes. What if you have civil unrest? There are error modes and emergency modes that elevators can have to not go to the lobby. There's literally a mode called riot mode. And it's enabled in some big uh, like museums and other places of culture where they want to protect much of the resource and whatever's in the building during unrest outside in the streets. The elevator will literally run at normal operation around a building on the upper floors, will not platform at the lobby, will not open its doors for the lobby. It will not like let people storming in from the lobby get into the building. It's kind of neat. Don't rely on that, however. This is the first of our many points about don't rely on your elevator exclusively as a security protocol. Because there are certain overrides in elevator systems. There are certain special modes, not in every elevator, some are more prevalent than others, that throw a lot of this security out the window. So for instance, in medical centers, in the US we call it code blue operation or medical emergency operation. I'm pretty sure it's called that up here too. 
The idea of if you have a key, turn this key switch, you now have priority to control that elevator as if you were a mini supervisor in that moment. If you just need an, or if you need an elevator that's not there right now, let's say you are at the lobby. And let's say all the other elevators are somewhere else in the building servicing other demand. But you're a doctor, you got a patient, they're coding out, they're on a gurney, throw in your code blue key, it will take the closest elevator to you in any of the elevators in the bank, reverse its direction if necessary, platform it at the lobby or wherever you used your key, and literally sometimes there's a voice announced like, this elevator is needed for other purposes, exit now and just kick everyone out of the elevator, and then it's your elevator. Now imagine if there's a building with riot mode enabled because something happened, and the people are you know, running through the lobby tearing it up. What if somebody has a priority service key? Does it allow, which they're not super restricted, right? Does it allow somebody to suddenly call your elevator that you thought couldn't go to the lobby? I don't know. I don't know how your elevator controller's configured. It's however somebody set it up, stacking those priority requests. There are interesting security blockages that some buildings try to use. For instance, baby theft mode. If the little baby Lojack that most hospitals use now sets off an alarm because somebody moved a baby without authorization, it's supposed to lock certain doors, it's supposed to set off an alarm, it's supposed to lock the elevators. I don't know if you can override your elevator if it's in baby theft mode, if somebody has, let's say, an independent key, which we'll talk about in a minute. Security recall is another very similar feature. This is manually activated, not by a little sensor like an RFID, but somebody can literally say, click this elevator, stop it from going to this floor, or hey, I think there's somebody suspicious who just got on elevator six. Bring it to this floor immediately and sit there with the doors open so we can like arrest him. Is your security recall going to behave like a man trap? Or is it going to get overridden if somebody else has other keys to other special modes? What do we use as pen testers? What do we do on jobs to override and throw a lot of security out the window? Well, two or three things, basically. One of them I strongly recommend you look into if you're checking your security in your own building, independent service. It is far and away one of the most common special modes. It's built into most elevators. Even if you don't see a key switch or a toggle switch, it might be there behind a hidden panel. Independent service, here we see just manual toggle switches for independent service. It basically gives you local admin rights on that elevator. Now, if there are card readers enabled, if there are security lockouts on certain floors, any number of conditions that are supposed to prevent you from moving around a building, most of the time I've flipped independent service on an elevator, it has thrown those out. The other fun thing, it also ignores all the hall demand. So if I'm in an elevator and I flip it to independent, not only can I usually go to any floor, even ones I wasn't supposed to, but it'll sit there with its door shut until I tell it, open the doors. I've hidden in elevators for hours in like jobs where we kind of you know, saunter our way in during the day, nobody notices, nobody's checking badges. I've just taken an elevator, turned it to independent, sat there for four hours, like texting my friends and catching up on Twitter, waiting till the team outside is like, hey, it looks like everyone's uh, gone home for the day, Dave. So I'll drive the elevator down to the lobby, I'll just walk, open the door and let everyone in. And it's the perfect hiding place. Because, you know, if you have a building and the bank of elevators is like eight wide, no one is ever like going to lunch and be like, oh, yeah, I want to get some Timbits. All right, man. Hey, have you noticed elevator five hasn't been responding all day? Suspicious. Like, nobody says that. Nobody, you just get on the first elevator that gets there. And I'm like snickering away. Just some, one time I rolled a chair into the elevator to have somewhere to sit. I was like, oh, this chair's broken. Got to take it downstairs. Uh, yeah, like it's a perfect hidey hole that most buildings have and you might not realize that. What is more powerful than independent service though? Because I say it, it varies how the commands are stacked up. Maybe a certain floor cutout is still enabled even if you flip independent because it has to, usually not, usually independent throws all that out. Guaranteed to almost always throw out all your security is fire service mode. Fire service mode, emergency responder mode, is by code part of almost every elevator, at least here in North America. By code, you might have someone who says, I demand that floor seven is the data center and no one, you need a badge and you need this and that. The boss can have all the demands he or she wants and the elevator tech can try to program the elevator all the way you want. All that gets thrown out the window if an emergency responder needs to get somewhere. And this goes for old and new systems. So you can even see elevators that they'll get retrofit, they'll get modernized, it's called. And all of a sudden, if you like look to this side view here, you can see this elevator on this side didn't used to have all the same fire controls. 
Now they've got an extra panel that was put in to come up to compliance. This is code compliance stuff. The idea that in an emergency, if the elevator thinks the building has a fire condition, a smoke or heat condition, which you can totally fake, either by exploiting what's called the back net, we won't have to get into that, or by manually throwing an elevator into fire service mode, which you can do, and usually it does not result in alarms going off, you can absolutely gain the powers that an emergency responder would have in an emergency situation, which means no security stops for you. All floors accessible, go where you want. By the way, there is one more powerful mode than fire service mode. It's kind of crazy, like who could possibly be more important than, a, than like a fire crew, an emergency responder crew. Any, any ideas? Yeah, yeah, the elevator techs themselves. There's elevator technician service mode. There is, it's called hoistway mode, also sometimes called inspection service mode. And it is exactly that. It is for getting into the hoistway and moving around in the hoistway to either inspect things, service things, adjust things, you name it. If you are in the hoistway, if you are running on inspection service, running at inspection speed is slow, but it throws everything out the window. Every possible lockout, every possible preventative measure in every elevator I've ever heard of, outside of maybe some crazy spooky federal buildings. Other than that, like everything is yours to do whatever you want with if you're in the hoistway. Hoistways are effing dangerous. You, and I'm looking to like all of you, probably don't belong in the hoistway. You can find little panels and access chutes and things if you do a lot of urban exploring. I do not recommend you ever go near this stuff. Now that said, if someone does, there are run controls in the hoistway. They're on the car top. You're gonna see that later. You should not be screwing around with this if you don't know the industry. Because this industry, is, again, like if you're not from this industry, look at this key switch right here. This is the motor generator shutdown key switch. That's if you need to take one of the motors just out of service, if you need to turn it off. How do you think you turn shutdown mode on in this elevator? Well, you turn shutdown to on. Like, that's the kind of thinking that you need to know. And it's, it's a really bizarre-ass industry on some of its controls. If you don't know how things are working, you shouldn't be messing around with them. Let me instead show you us messing around with them, and then you can take this knowledge home. There are various kinds of elevator securities that have been implemented trying to prevent people from moving around a building. They can usually all be subverted. So disabling your ability to just call an elevator is common. It's common in a lot of schools and other environments where like the teachers can use the elevator but the kids can't. I see it in airports a lot of the time. So either there's just no hall call buttons or they're disabled by a switch. Now you might have like a, maybe even in a hotel where like this was a little Holiday Inn I stayed at. It looks like that's a button, but it's not. This is just a light, an indicator light. The only way to get the elevator is to throw my key card for my room into it. It latches a call, the elevator arrives. Now you notice there was another key switch right near that button that wasn't a button, right? What key switch was it? It was red. Yeah, that's the fire control switch. You can manually throw the elevator, that exact elevator, into fire service mode, and it would platform right away for you too. Here is a little pin pad based system. Again, the floor call won't be registered. The hall call won't be registered unless you have the pin. This is in an airport. What is right below it? A regular key switch that either turns on or turns off that functionality. You might have seen key switches in the cab. These are called floor cutouts. So the idea of oh, floor three, floor four, you can manually toggle them on or off. These are not series circuit, like you're breaking the circuit that operates that push button. Remember, if a fire responder gets in the elevator, they don't have time to figure out which floors are unlocked and locked and like mess with 18 keys. This is all logic gates. And just because the logic gate is closed by one switch, the button still works. The controller is either ignoring it or allowing it based on what you are doing and what special mode you're in. Independent mode usually throws all these out the window. Fire service mode always throws all these out the window. The most typical elevator restriction you'll usually see involves key card systems, right? So like big hotels, posh hotels where you can't get up to, I think the hotel I'm staying at, yeah, you and I are at the, uh, we're the Fairfield, and we need our little Kaba RFID key to get up to the, our floors. There's absolutely ways around that if the elevator's running in special modes of operation. Think of physically securing your elevator as literally something you would have to do like this. Like, this is from a corrections environment, and this is the only thing I would consider a very secured elevator. 
the idea of caging off the elevator. Why am I, like, that's a goofy looking photo, right? And it's a photo in our slide deck because Howard was there investigating an accident. Somebody actually stepped off the elevator and I think the hoistway doors closed, like, and then they were pinned in like this one foot space and they couldn't go anywhere because they forgot that, you know, that, that I don't know what the hell they were doing. They were, who, maybe they were trying to escape. But anyway, you can sue anybody in my freaking country. So there they were taking photos of this. But why am I saying this is like securing your elevator? Well, think of your elevators as just a giant open stairway in your building and not lockable. And what you're about to see in the next few slides should hopefully reinforce that. The idea of my elevator is providing me security is something that you really want to wipe out of your brain. And while you don't need to make like a cage around your elevator, that stairwell analogy is valid. And if you want a really secure environment, like vestibuling off the elevator landing area, the elevator lobby landing, like that's your best course of action for really secure floors. So how can we subvert just about everything we just talked about there? Well, when there's no hall call buttons, this is a funny little video from a school. Did we see what happened there? Let's watch that video again. All right. What the hell? Person, did anybody see what they did? Shout it out. Yeah, they, they stuck an envelope or a paper through the door. They tripped the door sensor. The door sensor, which will not work all the time, right? But the elevator happened to be platformed at that floor, and they just tripped the door sensor into popping open because it's like, oh, so there's an obstruction in the doorway. Let me open my doors. That completely works in a lot of environments. Should you, is, this, is this me recommending that you just stick stuff randomly through closed hoistway doors? No, no, you misinterpreted me, sir. No, no, don't do that. The key, cards, the key cards are super common in a lot of buildings, right? So key card systems allowing you access. Never discount the possibility that there might be a little locked panel. And let's see, here we've got a, all right, I can, I can register a call to seven, seven, but I think the top eight, floors in this building were more nine. locked out. So let's try like, let's say 33. Yeah, can't get up there. I need, that's a badge reader right there. But what's below the badge reader? Well, there's a little panel and literally a switch that says card reader off. Yay! Card reader no longer necessary. And you can even flip the switch back and re-enable that mode. I've already latched the call. You can tell this is an Otis elevator. It's actually an Otis Series 7 elevator. So that would be a BGM 30 key that's on that locked panel. Why do I know this kind of stuff? Well, because most elevators have default keying on all of their fixtures. They come from the factory keyed a certain way that's name brands, off brands, third market brand, third party market brands, like aftermarket brands. If you've never checked this stuff out, and a lot of people in the industry don't even realize that, it's completely possible that you might have default keys for your building. Like, it's like it's not changing your passwords on a router that you installed in your building. So yeah, we're just, you know, riding all the way up to the top floor, getting some free whatever snacks or liquor was at this crazy bar in some, I guess this was in Hawaii somewhere. So yeah, like literally, card reader on off totally exists as a thing in a lot of card reader based elevators here it is in another elevator this is in las vegas like where you would think security is a serious thing here's more toggle switches in other elevators these little switches which are sometimes behind locked panels sometimes behind hidden panels if you can get to them there are a lot of ways of triggering other modes of operation interestingly enough and you'll start to see this in some of the pictures people in the elevator industry often don't realize that these keys are repeating themselves. You'll sometimes even see, like Howard calls this, elevator graffiti. When elevator techs will be like, oh, the run stop is uh, Kone 1 and the independent is Kone 4. It looks like fire service mode, phase 1 and 2, is e that's an innovations key switch, EX515. So people are like scratching down notes to themselves, which keys work where. Well, Howard, when he's worked in this industry for year after year after year, and the way his brain is kind of funny like some of ours is, he just started logging all these keys and then collecting all these keys. And now, like Murdoch Monkey's holding a little, you know, one of our key sets up here, not nearly as big as Howard's, right? But we have the default keys for basically every brand of fixture and elevator system that exists out there. There's not, there's like a lot of names in this industry. There's not that many names. And if you're on a, like a pen test job like me or, you know, on any of our team, we will send photos to Howard. We're like, we're, de we're texting him. We're like, dude, tell me what this is. He's like, you know what it is. It's a slightly concave button. It has the indicator on top of it. It's a Schindler. 
I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. He's like, yes, you did. You should listen to me more. So, yeah, like we, there's a lot of fixtures, right? But you can start identifying them, recognizing them, and knowing exactly what key you need or what key you need to test if you're testing your own building out. Just because something all looks, oh, this is all so unique and every elevator looks different. No, man, no. Epco, like this one right here, super huge vendor of aftermarket parts. If you see that super thick black halo with that Helvetica font, like Epco all day long. If you ever doubt, when I'm on a job, sometimes I'll like text Howard a photo. I'll be like, hey man, I just emailed you something. I'm uh, texting you. I need to know what key it is. He's like, it's probably Epco. I'm like, dude, my email didn't even send yet. He's like, yeah, try, try Epco. It's probably Epco. You know this. And sure enough, usually I'm like, damn it, it's Epco 1. You're right. Thanks. Even futuristic systems, or what's a futuristic, cutting edge, like destination dispatch elevators, if you've ever seen these, where there's no controls in the cab. You register your destination in the lobby, and it directs you to a different elevator. It says, okay, go to elevator A, go to elevator B. Some hotels have that, and it just gets people moving around the building more efficiently. Every one of those has to be able to operate in an emergency condition for fire responders. Every destination dispatch elevator has a hidden panel with all of the floor, call, floor buttons there that you can register calls on. Sometimes they're not even locked out. Sometimes if you pop that panel, you can just start, like I can go to 42 right there, just, it just latches a call like it's a conventional elevator controller. But forget about you know, cutting edge stuff. This is an industry that's still really in the past with most of its controls. So for example, these are all screenshots of elevator controller software. Does this look like super ultra modern to you? It looks just modern enough to be throwing it on like an XP box on the network so you can remote control it. That's about it. They're running in DOS box environments. They're running in really old Windows environments. There are, this is the nature of the industry, though. The idea of, oh, wow, we could, we could totally put a little Ethernet chip on our controller board, and I, yeah, we can get that thing hooked up to the network, do some remote management, remote monitoring. Sounds great. Remember, this is not an industry that focuses on security. Security to the elevator industry means you not dying. It doesn't mean you not going to the wrong floor. So like, here we go, you know, put in your password, right? Let's look at the, let's go ahead and look at the LiftNet user manual for the default passwords, right? This is every LiftNet install, unless you use the default administrator controls to change the default user passwords. And hopefully like change your administrator creds too. Do you think the average elevator techs are doing that? No, they're really not. MCE, another huge supplier of elevator parts. This is MCE and Gen, and this is one of their controller systems. This is in their manual. They say, hey, if you have an MCE system, you want your remote support, be sure to create a user on your router and for remote access, call it MCE support, and be sure to set the password to MCE support. While you're at it, go ahead and set the router password to MCE support. Just set everything to MCE support so that we can always get in uh, you know, whenever we need to do something to your elevator. Like, that's in the manual. That's what they're telling customers to do. Yeah, you get that from vendors all the time, right? How about from like your government? Like the government itself, the, the regulatory bodies, the elevator industry in working with the government developed something called the FEO K1. The FEO K1 was designed to be like the supreme godfather fire key. Because again, every brand of fixture kind of had their own fire keys. You know, Otis was UTF and Innovation was EX515 and on down the line. So they said there's too many keys. As if there's like a big problem with this, like, you know, you show up at the job site, you get the, I guess if a fire truck is driving around town and there's this building, that building, and the other building, they want one key, okay, I get it. FEO K1, and if it's going to be this powerful key, shall only be possessed, it says, in the code by elevator personnel, responders, etc. No one else should have this key. So like any good government operation and bureaucracy, they put the direct bidding code in the freaking code when they, like, that's in the published code document. Been there since 2007. And yes, up here, you use the FEO K1 on a ton of your systems. If you see a tubular key in an elevator, like you got some elevators in this country, right? There's some big ones. It's probably FEO K1. If you're not sure of it, you know, I'm going to give you a better than 50% chance. It, all the ones that I've allegedly heard somebody test totally were FEO K1. But just bear in mind, like it's, again, it's all naked on the inside too, right? So the car panel, you're just, you know, you're just clicking dry contacts together. If you can interact with the rear side of that panel, which no one should ever do, including whoever this person, which is totally not me in this video, should ever do. Because you're talking like, you know, those are live mains back there. There's some serious voltage on the other side of this panel that you shouldn't be touching. 
But let's say you have a situation like this where the swing panel was not really secured. Somebody may have just popped that with a knife blade. Now, you can't register a floor call to, like, I think the top floor of the building here, to floor 12. We want to see floor 12. Well, there's independent service mode. And if you don't have the key for that key switch, well, again, it's just contacts. You can pull those apart and barehanded like an ass face, drunk, somebody might just push those two contacts together. Now independent service mode is enabled. Now you can go ahead and register and latch a call onto floor 12. And because you're in independent mode, you have to manually like drive the door shut or open and whatever you want to do. Completely janky and hokey, right? Absolutely valid on a pen test. You want to get somewhere you don't want to be in a building. Why look for stairwells that are unlocked or weird back? Like, I've, you know, oh, I go up the fire exit, somebody once said to me. I was like, yeah, I'm going to look for the elevators. The first thing I always look for. Because half the time, it's going to take me where I want to go. And I don't even have to use my legs all that much. So there we are. Now we're just, you know, reconnecting everything back up. That's completely what we do as pen testers in buildings. Inside of a target facility, if I can find an elevator, I can usually leverage that elevator. How do we do it? Most of the time, it's way cleaner than that ugly video. Most of the time, it's, you know, key switches. If we get the keys, which most of the time we can find the keys correctly because they're not changed, they're default keys, we can do stuff like this. Here was an example target where we used fire service. The front of the building had a security lobby. It had a guard. It had, you know, please sign in. Are you on the list? And we thought we might be able to bluff by them. If you've ever seen a good social engineering talk, like, good stuff, right? We said, all right, well, they, they seem to be, we're looking at them through the lobby like glass. We're like, yeah, they're, they're looking pretty tight in there. I don't know if we can just breeze our way in. Let's walk around the building a little bit. Around the back of the building, though, there was an entrance. It was on the parking deck, which already they thought no one could get to because you needed a badge for the company to get the gate arm to, like, let you up the ramp. Yeah, we walked up the ramp. Completely blew the client's mind. They're like, how did you get to that back door? I was like, I, I have legs. <laughs> like... I went up the ramp. I walked up the ramp. So from the back parking deck, we went in the back door, which you'll see was like locked, but it wasn't like locked. Uh, and then there was an elevator. And this elevator, we could call it at the lobby, but we couldn't go anywhere because we needed a badge or not. And as you'll see, we shot a little bit of footage, and the client was so effing stunned that they pulled security camera footage. They said, you didn't, there's, I, no, that, you can't take that elevator. It's not, you got in the building a different way. Pull that footage. They literally, the client thought we were lying. Here's, here's some footage of this. So we're on the back parking deck. The door is locked, but like it's not like locked well. That's a whole other talk. So now we can call the elevator. And now things are going to happen very quickly with multiple sets of keys that are kind of out of spec. Ready? Ready. On. On. Phase on. one. On. Phase two. So now that elevator jewel is lit. This elevator is running on fire service right now with no keys in the ground floor plant key switch, which is not normal. But we can drive it up to whatever floor we want to go to. It will platform at whatever floor we tell it to. And then if we manually drive those doors open, we can hop out on whatever floor we want to. And the culture of this building is such that once you were upstairs, like nobody questioned you. you were, oh, you must have come through that security desk. So you were just presumed good. We just walked in all day for a couple of keys that almost anybody can get. You shouldn't be able to get these keys. This was in New York City, however. So in New York City, there's this infamous key, right? This like 2642 key, which everybody freaked out when a newspaper like printed pictures of it. I'll print a giant ass picture right here for you. It's not like I'm breaking, you know, some crazy security. Literally, it's an unrestricted blank cut to 26420. That's every elevator in New York City. That's the fire service key. You can do that in any building. You shouldn't. I'm not telling you to. Somebody could. Or if you want to do the whole greater New York region, this is four effing states, including my original home of New Jersey. 3502 key, unrestricted key. Anybody can cut this. There are many, many statewide keys that if you know how to find them, or maybe if you can't order them, maybe you can order, like, the key box. Like, this is in the state of Indiana down in the U.S., Every building can have its own fire key, but you have to use the Indiana key box. Well, you can order it, you just can't order it with the key. What can you do, however, if you've never tried tubular picking? We will totally show you tubular picking later. If you pick a tubular lock, not only does the lock open, but then you can decode it and you can cut your own key. Bam, there's the Indiana key. And we then like, could return the box if we wanted to back to the vendor. We did that in Minnesota. 
We did that in Kentucky. Kentucky uses Medico systems. Medico is a nicer key system, right? They ship you the box unlocked because you have to mount it on the wall. You can't buy the key. You can buy the box. You can then take the lock apart very carefully. And if you've never done any physical like eval of hardware, it's not that hard to inspect pins inside of a lock and get the bidding, including the sidebar bidding for this Medico lock. Oh, and we did it in Florida, which is split up into all different zones. And we did it in Louisiana. And we did it in Virginia. And there's other states where if you look at their state codes, they just have state keys. These keys are not as restricted as people say. We have built our own pen testers key rings, and they are always with us on jobs. Leveraging the elevators to go where you want them to go is not hard for an attacker to do. Many times it's stupid easy when, like, for some reason, one of your maintenance staff or your elevator contractor, they want a key box on site. Look around near your machine spaces. Look for little key boxes. Many times they are very simple locks. They are either wafer locks or tubular locks. They're pickable. Or, you know, that, that, I'm telling you, man, that FEOK1 is a bitch for security. Let me show you a little FEOK1 story that we added into our, our little shtick here, right? This is a key box up above an elevator right in the lobby landing of a big building. We could walk in from the outside, act like we're just going upstairs. In the process, use an FEOK1 to pop that key box. It contains the master maintenance and override keys for the building. It contains the, emer the stuff that an emergency responder needs to get anywhere in a building is in that box. Here's maintenance space keys. This maintenance space, which of course is also where like the camera system is for the building. All the security hardware was in here. All the router switches, everything was in here. Then the next key on the key ring was the key box. It was the, another key for the maintenance room, the motor room. That has a key box in here that we were able to pick open. What does that have? Well, it has a hoistway, drop, a hoistway door drop key. Like we'll show you what that can do too. But the idea of one little box with one little key that let me into everything in an entire building, including like this is the fire service key for the building. This is the alarm panel key for the building. These are the sprinkler controls, the sprinkler valves for the building. Like I could run amok for this one key. One FEOK1 did all of that. And it's all over the internet. Like the FEOK1 really needs to die. If you have any pull with anybody in a regulatory sense, please help them understand that people, especially really unscrupulous people, are selling these keys without a care in the world. There are, like this, this is somebody who actually works in the elevator industry. And that's, they operate multiple companies under other names, selling parts kind of out the front door and then selling other keys out the back door. And that is, that is not cool, bro. Like the idea that any boner can just get an FEOK1 and walk around a building, yeah, render. Yeah, Render's saying that if you, have the, if you know the spec, you don't even have to buy something off, off you know, eBay. You can walk to a locksmith who can code cut keys. Yeah, he says even looking like he does, he has walked into locksmiths and say, I need a seven-pin key, a seven-pin tubular key, and I need to cut to this bidding. You know? And they're going to charge you, right? They're going to charge you, what, like 40 50 bucks maybe at the high end, 20 bucks in the low end. Four or five? You can get tubular keys up here for four or five bucks? Damn, exchange rate or something, man. Shit, I got to get my keys up here. Yes, so Render does point out that because the standard never specified clockwise or counterclockwise, people have sometimes made, like some industry switches have made them wrong. So uh, technically it's supposed to be cut clockwise. That is the standard for all tubular keys if you're looking at the, you know. Anyway, it's funny that sometimes, you know, fire techs now carry two of them. But the idea that you can just get this key for very little money and do everything that I'm talking about very easily, that's kind of creepy in my mind. Way creepier, especially when my mom saw this presentation, is that hoistway stuff, though, right? We had another job. We had a medical facility where we could be on a low floor. We were, like, on two or three, and we wanted to get up to the fourth floor, which had this radiation lab and all the drug storage and stuff. And we said, well, we can't seem to move around the building easily. And it was an older elevator. It hadn't been modernized with fire, you know, fire mode that we could access, which is not always required in some parts of the U.S. We could use the hoistway, though. How did we use the hoistway? Well, we did this. Completely out of spec. This is not how you're supposed to do this. We let the cab kind of dro drop down, let it recall itself to the lobby, we're like checking. This is with a drop key. This is what you can get in that other little black box you saw. 
Oh, look, the elevator has dropped down a little bit to the, almost to the next floor. Pop the hoistway door, which should stop and should arrest the elevator's movement. We can then get on the car top. And I said, the car top has run controls, right? So here's all of us getting in on one floor, and we're going to just ride the car top up the hoistway to another floor. Those hoistway doors, by the way, which you're not supposed to be able to pop open when you're like in the hall like we were. Do you think there's any kind of lock or key or anything you need on the inside of those doors to pop them open? No, there is not. So that door okay. is shut. Elevator is back on power. Going up. Going up. Going up. We can drive it from the run control box on the car top. We can, we can drive can it down, down. Or we can drive it up. Go down. And up. Go up. We entered on two. Is this smart or safe? No. There we go. Legs are on three. Stop. But sure enough, worked really well. There is no protection in the hoistway from this. And you can just send it down. Unit. If you are in the hoistway, especially on the car top, for safety of life reasons, you have absolute control. You are the god of that elevator in that moment. From the motor room, from the machine room, you can literally remake the universe, though. You can change variables and inputs. You can change conditions on the motor. If you saw like Barnaby Jack's talk, the late Barnaby Jack, anybody remember him before he passed? So he talked about jackpotting ATMs, where he would literally say, this bill hopper, uh, it doesn't contain uh, $20 bills, it contains $5 bills. Spit out four more at a time. And like, he would change variables. You can do that. You can do that from the controller, if you know how to interact with the controller software. You can do that right from the dry contacts. You can click and connect just jumper wires to various contacts and jump out certain sensor conditions. These are part of the tests that elevator techs run on a routine basis. So you're about to see what looks like an elevator accident. This is not an elevator accident. This is a test of the pit buffer. The elevator is going to hit the buffer at full travel speed. It'll be fun. But it's going to blow by a bunch of safety systems in the process. And the only way that happens is that a tech in the motor room has jumped out those sensors. happens regularly in elevators to be tested for how well they can absorb error conditions. That's something that elevator techs get to just do with like test weights that they have to lug and put in the cabs. Do we not do this if you don't know what you're doing. And, uh, Messing around in the motor room is a live game. These are high, you know, there's, there's going current going through these wires. Kind of cramped in there. You don't so know what, what you're doing. Did was shock a spare wire. Not like, oh, here. shock, surprise, but like... And I took the three out, like this and I ran one stuff. wire, spare yeah. wire, as you can see, let's see if Jesus, what the hell was that? Yeah, d just be careful. You should, this is more in the you shouldn't be doing this evidence side of things. There was an elevator accident that was investigated by Howard and his team, and what you're seeing here is a clip from a video, like you'll see when an elevator was jumpered incorrectly, when the safeties were not interlocking correctly, the elevator was running without the door being fully closed yet. And this ultimate, like, whoop, that ain't no good. And that caused a pretty grievous injury. Thank God it was in a hospital. The woman was saved, but she was, it was bad, dude. It was bad. It was ugly. So if you don't know what's going on in your motor room, if, you're, if people are getting into your motor room, they shouldn't be up there. We'll show you a little bit about that later. Really quick, I don't want to go too far over on time. We've got some more slides, but any, like, old-school phone freak hackers... There's phones in a lot of elevators, usually by code. These phones have regular phone lines pulled through the motor room, through the traveling cable, into the elevator car. If you can get to that phone line, there's a lot you can do. Like, we always travel with some little, you know, we used to have lineman's butt packs, but they were big, little, little handset. Like, the, uh, the tiny, this little, like, tiny, it's like it's a phone that fits in the palm of your hand. Keep one of these around. Getting to that phone line, you could do interesting stuff, making calls from within the building, making calls out of the building. If you call the phone itself, like if you can figure out the elevator phone number, which maybe it's just written inside the panel like this, you can, the phones are usually configured to automatically pick up silently on one ring. Then you're just on the call with the elevator. Now, what do you do with this information? Well, you could be mischievous and be like, I'm watching you. I'm the elevator. I know what you did. Like you can try to make people think they're crazy, I guess. That's fun in its own right. Or you could just call up an elevator and not say anything at all. Just listen. People use elevators like 
refuge, secluded spaces where they have very private conversations. And in very big cities, when government officials are in town for like, you know, G8 summits and stuff, you are not going to be too surprised, I bet, if I tell you that the phone company has specialists come in. And they're like, all right, why is there activity on this line? All right, what's that line doing? That's, <laughs> that's not an elevator. Why is, what's happening? Trace that call. Like, there are people who will try to like, listen to elevator calls, and, like listen to the elevator phones. There are sometimes just intercoms in the elevator. Again, usually based around the machine room. In the machine room, just turn that elevator intercom on. Listen to what's going on in there. Your elevator is not a secure environment, both for restricting movement or for having private conversations. Really quick, just on the building owner sort of supervisory side, if you have authority in your building, especially if problems in your building fall under your head, please be aware that you should have a little more active oversight than a lot of people do over their maintenance. Like, this is a, this is a maintenance control program. This is an MCP. Just freaking blank. And it's not like this is a default one that came out. Like, this was an accident site. And Howard and the guys showed up. Like, wow, you guys didn't even fake it. You didn't fill anything out at all. You just, you got no maintenance for years. Okay, that sounds good, guys. There are all kind of weird hacks in the industry. They once looked at these circuit breakers for one elevator that was, you know, having some problems. They flipped open the panel. Those aren't fuses. Those are just bus bar. They're just, they're just bar connected. Like, yeah, we kept blowing fuses. We didn't know what to do. So, you know, like, that was your solution? You're like, yeah, well, it kept running. Like, that is the kind of stuff that elevator techs will sometimes do to get... Because when the elevator's down, everyone is hopping mad. Everyone's saying, fix it now, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. And you get tired of going out there. Elevator techs will do something like this. Look at the second fuse from the left. See anything odd about it? There's a little bit of wire. A little bit of wire wrapped around that fuse. It's taking just enough of the resistance load off that fuse to prevent it from blowing. And that's totally what they did. Old style relay logic systems where there's contacts clacking on and off. This is carbon dust blowing all over the inside of a, of a you know, controller box, which is conductive because that's what you want inside among all your contacts, right? That's just great conditions here. They were on one job and they were like, why are there so many oil pads and like bags of oil dry in the corner of this hydraulic motor room? So they looked at the tank, they popped open the controller, you know, the pump system. There was like a dishpan, oil pad saturated. There was so much oil spewing out of this thing. The hydrofluid was soaking the test tag, which was illegible. And they're like, how long has this been like this? And the building owner was like, mm -hmm. And yet it falls onto that building owner. It falls onto plant ops and maintenance. If there's an incident, this is something that could be going on. And if most people don't have keys to their own motor room. Most of the time, you can't easily get into your motor room. That's something your elevator you know, contractor is doing. Stick your head in there once in a while. Ask what's going on. Find out if there's any kind of conflicts of interest or collusion going on. There are situations where inspection says this needs to be replaced, but does it need to be replaced? Like, this is a test tag. This was an inspection on an Otis elevator system. And you can see the inspection was done by Otis. Like, unless the inspection tech's name was Otis, this is bullshit. There was a job that Howard was on where they kept re-roping the cables. Tens of thousands of dollars every time. They were run. oh, your cables, they're getting pretty tired. The cable's going bad. We've got to restring it. Howard crawled into a maintenance space, found the original install cable from the 70s, was still tagged. They had never changed the cables. They were just charging the client over and over and over. And this is the kind of stuff. I'm not saying this is common. The elevator industry is no more corrupt or less corrupt than any other industry, really. But if you're getting, like, red tagged, if, if you're not taking an interest in your elevator systems, this can happen. In the end, like, your tests are important. This is an elevator test being performed. And failing, motor generator like ripped off the one of its you know install plates. That was a final acceptance test for final readiness. It was not ready. Uh, but more than that, like you're not that's not your main shtick, right? Security is and follow your building procedures. Badge people in and out. We've breezed into buildings just saying, oh, we're here for your semi annuals. We're the elevator folk, you know. People just, oh yeah, I guess so. You, do you need the keys or something? We're like, oh, thank you. Yes. If your security guard is an elevator you need to fire that security guard. It's not doing what you think it's doing. And when people say, oh, what's the worst that can happen? Like, this is an elevator security system. This is, you need a badge and it's a biometric and you need pin, it's three-factor authentication. Why? This is in an airport. But what does it have? This is fire service mode and that jewel is lit. 
This is us able to drive an elevator from the sterile zone, or sorry, from down in the parking zone to the sterile zone of an airport. Now, you can do that on just a test and simulate what could happen, or somebody can buy a $4 FEOK-1 and actually get to the sterile zone from the open area zone very easily. And the more you know about elevators and elevator controls and elevator key boxes, you're going to start seeing them, places that you maybe weren't noticing them before, I hope, and start thinking about them and start thinking what this means for your building. There are regular elevator techs doing your parts oil and grease, and there are elevator security consultant techs, and they are two very different animals. Just because your installer or your tech says, oh yeah, this an elevator can never go up without a badge, that's what they might think. That's probably not reality. Talk to someone who knows. And if you're in that crowd where you're like, I really don't want my elevator on the internet, but I love the idea of remote monitoring, there are ways to do that. Like, you don't need to set default passwords like manager and technician and just call it good and kick it down the road. There are third-party add-on systems that will give you non-Ethernet-based non connectivity to your dry contacts for monitoring things like what mode is my elevator in, why is it running in this condition. You can do that talking to the right people. Final tips, then I'm going to get out of the way and we'll get us back on schedule. If you are ever stuck in an elevator or someone you know is stuck in an elevator, first of all, don't panic. Remember, elevators are very safe. They are not likely to cause you harm. You're not going to run out of air. You're just going to have a story to tell. Now, there's some things you can try. If the main lights are off, if only the emergency light is on, you got bigger problems. You're pretty much not getting it out of that elevator until it gets power, maybe even emergency power, which a lot of elevators have. If the main lights are on, though, try to press door open. A lot of people, if the air elevator errored out or didn't latch a call or doesn't know where it's going, the door operator might work just fine. Press door open. Or press door close and then press door open to recycle the door operator. Reset it, try it out, maybe it opens. Place calls to other floors. Place lobby calls. There may be a condition where it's expecting a badge input of some kind, or you don't know. You don't know what could have gone wrong, but try all the other floors. Just because one floor isn't working, others might. Make sure you are badged in. If you have any kind of credential, keep trying it for every single floor. If you're authorized, start trying those key switches, man. If I'm in an elevator and it's not working, after five, ten minutes, I'm not waiting around for someone to maybe answer that phone. I'm Hey, let's see what these switches do. Independent. Get us, get us moving. Get us out of here. And lastly, verify the cab doors are closed. You don't ever reach through the cab doors, but if you can just put the flat of your hand on the door, see if it has any movement, try to make sure it's fully closed and interlocked. That will sometimes be causing the error in a really badly maintained elevator. Now, if nothing else works, yeah, go ahead. Call for help with your phone, with the e-phone, whatever you need to do. Things to never do. Never go through the top hatch. It's very popular in TV and film. It doesn't get you anywhere you need to be. Now you're just on top of a dark, filthy elevator, and if the power's out, you're still not getting it anywhere. I would not recommend this. Never exit a misleveled car, a badly misleveled car. If you have to jump, that is too far. If you can step out of a misleveled car, you're fine. Unintended movement is how people get pinched. This is how really bad things happen. This... Like, this is a maintenance janitor or something letting people out of a stuck elevator that he's wedged the doors open with, like, a bench. I, I mean, these people, whatever, maybe they were in there for a while. Looks like a lot of them were in there, and they got tired, and they get hot, and they want to get out. I would look right at this guy. I'd be like, wow, fuck a bunch of you, buddy. I'm waiting for proper people. Proper people, emergency responders, elevator techs, those are who you were speaking to when you were getting out of a badly misleveled car. Keep all that in mind. Stay safe. The safest place is usually in the elevator itself. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something, and I appreciate being here. Thank you very much. Um, will you be available for yeah, questions? We're gonna, yeah, we're going to go outside and have okay. all this stuff out there if you want to play with